Bound club. Andy, what is the population of Uruguay? Luis Suarez. What? Luis Suarez. Who's that? Luis Suarez is the population of Uruguay. Who is Luis Suarez? Luis Suarez's teeth. What? <laughs> Luis, Luis Suarez, his teeth are the population of Uruguay. Who's Luis Suarez? The footy player. Uh, thank you very much for joining this episode of Film Club. I'm one your host, Andy Harrison. To my right, as always, it's Luis Suarez. Every single week in Film Club, we invite you along to watch a film with us. We dive into some of cinema's Sorry. best before coming back here. He actually bit me, by the way, to talk it out. Andy, this week we've been talking about The Fountain. The Fountain by... Darren Aronofsky. I nearly said Dennis Villeneuve then. And reason. this is rolling off of last week where we yeah. took a look at... Uh, Requiem um, for a Dream. Yeah, Requiem for a Dream. Yeah. So we thought we'd carry on with Darren Aronofsky. This is the film we'd afterwards. Yes. Weirdly, six years apart. Yes. So, the, so give us the quick rundown. What's, what's The Fountain all about? The Fountain is uh, Hugh Jackman and his wife, Izzy, um, who is... Oh, we just said her name. Rachel Wise. Wise. Um, and it's basically set in three different timelines, uh, three different storylines. The main, the present, the past, and the future. So the past is uh, the Spanish, um, kind of like the Spanish people going to um, Aztecs and stuff like that. You know, what's it called? Southern America, basically. They're going to Southern America. The Mayans. Mayans, that's it. Sorry, my bad. They're going to the Mayans, and um, he's trying to find this, you know, he's trying to help the queen, who is Rachel Weisz, um, and he's, he's trying to find this um, tree of life and stuff. Um, in the present, uh, Izzy has a, I think it's a brain tumour or cancer or something. Yep. Uh, it's implied. I don't know if it's actually specified. And um, basically, he's like a doctor, and he's trying to find how to uh, cure of this. And then in the future, he's in like some sort of space, like kind of time, not time travel, like this kind of spaceship bubble thing with a tree who is supposedly his wife because he talks to her. And um, it's about accepting uh, the reality of death and uh, accepting death in a loved one, if not oneself. And it's all played out through this like real sort of fantasy realism blend where yeah. like you've got the main story and what I consider, I think most people would consider the main the, story the line, which is the present. Yes. Very, very big on realism. Yep. And then... As you as you hop into these other areas, you get the big one, which is obviously her story. Yes, which is all about oh yes, um, the past is her story that she writes in the present. Yeah, all about him going um, to find this Mayan temple, and then you also get these little jolts into like this spaceship thing. But they're all kind of like they're all kind of both thematically tied, and it's suggested that they are narratively tied as well. Yeah, like you know, it breaks dimensions, and like one person can affect another, and it's kind of intermingled this, that, and the other. Um, it reminded me of another film that has completely gone from me, so I'll leave that. Um, so this, this is a this is a big, I think, a big departure from Requiem for a Dream. Oh, aye. As a, as a film, and I know that it, it hit a bunch of like production problems along the way. Did it? Like it was meant to have almost double the budget. Did it? Oh, really? And it was supposed to be like Brad Pitt was supposed to be playing the main character, and then they had like budget issues going on. Brad Pitt drops out. Eventually, bringing Hugh Jackman, they decrease the budget and they decide to go forward with it anyway. Probably dropped out to do with the Tree of Life. Um, was that around the same sort of time? This I don't one? know. I'm just saying because it's a very Tree of Life film. It does feel a little Tree of Life. Yeah, this feels very much like um, Terence Malick. Terence Malick mixed with well, I guess I guess weirdly mixed with Darren Aronofsky. I'm thinking like Noah, what he would later on go to yes. do. Yes. But what do you think? <laughs> so I, I I've seen this before, and when I watched it back, it was one of those late night films, sci fi. I really enjoyed. And I must have like drifted out of this film, and I was thinking, no, I, re I remember the uh, s soundtrack, and it was fantastic. I remember the visual effects, I remember the, vaguely the storyline, but I wasn't as invested. Anyway, this time, obviously, I gave it a lot more investment, a lot more analysis, and I came to the end, which was meh slash nah. I think I'm infected, by the way. Oh, it's less Louis Suarez for the year. That. I'm kind of on board with you as well. It this was, too, was too Terrence Malick for me, and I know you'd probably find that as an insult to Terrence Malick, but I just... It was too much. It was too this and too that and the other. And I was just like, it could have been a bit more polished. It could have been, mm -hmm. there's too much emphasis and stuff like, I'm not, it's, it's ironic if anything, cause it's the same editor we were on about this last week. Yeah. Um, it's the same, I'll just double check. It's the same editor. I shouldn't say that. Not J. Rabinowitz. Yes, it was, because I remember yep, pr uh, mispronouncing that name. Guy. Um, it's the same editor. Obviously, direct, the editing's directed by the same director. Mm -hmm. And, um, I didn't think it worked for this. I'm not gonna lie. There's parts nope. it did where he turns around and it's like the bald guy and uh, Hugh Jackman in the future. But yeah, those cool. Like, I like that. I like the fact that that shows you that these timelines are all involved. But then there was other bits of editing. And I was just like, uh, I must admit as well, there was other parts I didn't like, which was, I mean, the story as a whole, really. But um, it's gonna sound weird. 
because I fucking rate the guy, Hugh Jackman. I think he's great. I don't think it was his best performance by a long shot. And there was parts in this I was thinking, Hugh Jackman, what are you doing? That's not well, you. Jim Roman did The Prisoners. And like Hugh Jackman, that is awesome. Yep. And he's been great in other stuff. Like obviously people are loving him right now because of like uh, Les Mis and, and um, The Great Showman. That's one. And like people have loved him for years because of like his Wolverine performance. And here he just feel he does feel a little bit like he's phoning it in. There's the odd moment where he gets to shine. I think um, right after her death, yes, is a really sort of like powerful moment. I do, no, but I, there's part of that I didn't like. It's when he gets really angry and he's like pushing the doctor up, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, I yeah. don't believe that. I like I, I didn't buy into that. Yeah, um, oh, he gets. Ah, but then I think the biggest problem this film has is that its its whole concept is a very difficult one to do well if it's possible to do it well at all. This idea that like. Okay, you've got you've got somebody dealing with one of unfortunately one of the most cliche elements of like uh, creating drama in a film, cancer. Death. Oh, okay. yeah, cancer, which ultimately yeah. leads to death, which All unfortunately is painfully cliche to deal with. It can be done really well, and there's obviously tons of ways. We've even seen it on the show done very very well. Um, now, mm. when it comes to dealing that, that's that's a problematic. But then tack onto it, there's this whole. Um, like escapism element, which is also really, really difficult to balance with a narrative. Because what tends to happen, and unfortunately what happens here, is the two narratives are completely disconnected. Thematically, yeah. they're tied. Yeah. yeah. Thematically, we get they're tied together. But they feel very, very different. It feels like we're watching Hugh Jackman and his wife having this sort of problem. Right, we're going to put that on hold now. And instead, we're going to hop over here and tell you about this Spanish guy who's trying to find a bunch of Mayans. And you go, why do I care about that? Actually, I want to get back to you watching like this actually like, emotionally effective um, relationship like that's sort of dwindling and dying. Why do I want to go on this weird swashbuckling adventure? I really, really, really don't. Imagine you have a chicken Caesar salad, yeah? And you've got this me. lovely chicken Caesar salad. Yep. Then you have this Mediterranean Greek Does it have Caesar sauce? feta salad there. Caesar. So you've got these two amazing combinations of salads. Salad. You put them the same thing, ride them around, and they don't really work together. How much lettuce is in there? My point is, it's peppers. Like peppers. too much into one bowl. And the, what he's done is it's just like, there's too much. Oh, we're going to put all this stuff in your head. We're going to give you affiliate, um, all this symbolism that's not fully symbolic in my, in my personal um, um, opinion. opinion. Thank you. And um, all this ex exposition, all this like kind of effects and everything. And the only thing, actually, and it's not tied together. And you just then you just left a bit like, all right, like this, and this is no like pushing in that you don't feel the death as he does. I didn't anyway. You don't feel the, the need to find this tree of life when you go back to the main, um, back in the past to the mains, you know, um, or in the future. He speaks to a fucking tree. That's when I lost it. That's when I fucking lost it. I said, This is Terrence Malick. Um, I'm fine with him speaking to the tree. No, no, I'm not. And then I just, I have absolutely no emotional attachment to the past of the present. The, um, sorry, the past of the future. I do more so the present, of course. Um, the only thing that does tie it together, and I said many times, it's fantastic. Is the score, and the score is absolutely brilliant. It's um, Clint Mansell absolutely smashing it. Um, so amazing. Um, if you think about the theme of this whole film, he has a really good thematic kind of score. Like Requiem has a thematic score. Um, this constant theme that's reused again and again in many different kind of um, instruments to portray the different um, the different uh, time periods. Yeah, um, and it all kind of like links everything together. But that's the only thing that fucking does it. And I'm like, come on. I really quite enjoy that the score is relentless. Like It's constant, isn't it? It, it feels, um, I think that's one of the things that gives it this feeling of uh, racing against time. One of the things it does quite well is that obviously he's desperately racing against time to get this thing, this some sort of cure found yep. before she dies. And I think one of the best ways he does that is by having that score constantly march yep. the film yep. onwards. And Requiem had a similar kind of constant march, as we were saying before, like Boogie Nights had a, not necessarily a march, but a constant soundtrack and everything like that. And it's really good to see films do that. Like I'm, I'm a huge mm. advocate for um, silence in film when it comes to like sound and uh, music as well, and like the right moments. But at the same time, flipped on its uh, on it on its head. Um, I'm a huge. I realise now a huge fan of using music to kind of roll the film forward and like kind of add fluidity to, uh, to scenes, to films, to themes, to movements. Um, and it just pisses me off that what could have been a great film is only pushed forward in my again personal uh, opinion. Um, via the music and it's just like I was actually really looking forward to watching this and I came <laughs> we had a little crack, crack at work today and I was like oh you know what was your film you did this week and I was like Fountain and obviously I was a bit pissed off still I was like shit don't watch it shit I wouldn't say it's shit 
obviously watch it. You might enjoy it. Apparently, it's got like a bit of a cult following. Me personally, I, can see that. I just don't feel it. I'm just not emotionally attached to it. It's a very emotional, surreal kind of film. It's not me. It's not me at all. And if it didn't have that soundtrack, I would personally say it's shit. But and like, I'm, I'm pretty much on board with for most of it. I think I'm slightly more inclined to like parts of it. My biggest problem comes from it feeling like it wants to have its cake and eat it too. Yeah, it wants That's a really good call. It wants to be um, kind of large and existential, like Tree of Life. It wants to have those Terence Malick elements, but then it also wants to get away with telling you a classic narrative. About, oh my wife! And then unfortunately, it also lives in that horrible like post Lord of the Rings period where everyone wanted to do like a period piece where people were wearing like leather and gloves and yeah. straps and things. Yeah, it feels very two thousand and six because of that. Yeah. Um, it's very formulated. So unfortunately, it wants to have its cake and eat it too. Whereas at least something like uh, Malik for me, and for I think people who enjoy Terence Malik, is nah. because he doesn't try to balance it with a classic narrative. You're either in or you're out. Whereas here, Darren Aronofsky just wanted the best of both worlds. And it's a real shame because Darren Aronofsky has done um, some great films I've not yet seen, supposedly great films, shall I say. Um, the Wrestler, I, I didn't realize that he did, and yeah, obviously yeah. Black Swan. Um, so it's not that he... I mean, every director has a bad film, I would say. Most directors pretty much um, have a bad film. Um, so I'm going to say that this is his. And Noah. I would actually like Noah an awful lot more than oh, this. Really? Oh, mate, oh no, but yeah, all more than this, but like, did you like Noah? I don't think it was uh, an amazing film, but it was, it was one of those Sunday films I'll chill out and watch and like, go in and out of. Return of the Sunday film. So there is the fountain. You can let us know in the comments below what you thought of the fountain, or you can hit us up on Twitter, as always. Do let us know if you enjoyed it, because I'd love to hear from some people who did really enjoy it. Maybe you are one of the people who got that cult following. What it was it about the that fountain? Cult following. Well, you know, like the, the film since it's been released on DVD, it's like really gathered this like audience. It's like I want to know what is it about it that's drawing people to that. Um, but we'll be back once again next week where we're going to take a look at, we haven't seen him for a while, Christopher Nolan, yes. we're taking a look at The Prestige. Well, this is Hugh Jackman, a fucking great performance, and Christian Bale, so just fucking keep watching, pay close attention, fantastic film. See you next week.